Okay, hi everybody. Um, so um, today's, we're going to talk about area profiles. We're kind of in the middle of the census releases, so some of this will be looking forward to what data we can expect to see later on. And the practical element is really focusing on the topic summary tables that have been provided. Um, and we'll go through that. Um, there are a couple of practical elements. Depending on how time goes, the second one I'll leave you with and explain uh, if we don't have enough time to go through it. But um, I'm going to move on now um, to what we're going to cover. So first of all, the purpose of today, which I said a little bit about, um, the kind of information that's available in the census, um, the scale at which you can look at it, and then practical exercise of accessing data. Um, with some kind of examples of how you might manipulate that data particularly. Um, as Jill said, if you have questions, then, then put them in the Q&A as we go along. With such a big audience, I'm not gonna try and answer them uh, in flight. I'm gonna kind of pick them up um, at the uh, point where you, you go on a, um, a practical exercise um, in accessing data. So, First of all, just thinking about what you're trying to do if you're developing an area profile, what are you interested in? Are you interested in economic outcomes, in demographic characteristics, etc.? So there are a number of kind of research areas where the census is particularly useful, and it's particularly useful because it provides you with a local geographic scale, which is hard for most other sources of data. There are some administrative data sources that do give you uh, local area geographies, uh, but the census is kind of unique in this baseline of characteristics of the population and so on. Um, in terms of thinking about what you're producing, you also need to think about who you're producing it for and therefore how you represent it. And, and there'll be a couple of examples of how to think about that. Um, so I'm not gonna cover the use of mapping, but I will use it for examples here. And uh, we will be running a course on QGIS, which is Shareware um, Geographical Information System that would enable you to, to do that. I think that's scheduled in May. Um, so looking at this, um, the, the topic data, uh, this has been released over, um, over the, the kind of you know, October, November, December, and January. Um, and what we've got is individual and household variables and for housing dwelling spaces. Um, and these are the main areas. So the first release was demography and migration. The rest have gone out of sequence, um, but I'm gonna go through these in more detail. So I'm not gonna go through the headings there. So looking at demography and migration, um, the individual variables we have is those people who usually live in an area, age, sex, whether they're in households or communal establishments, their partnership status, and then a whole set of things around kind of migration, I suppose, broadly, but a flag to say whether somebody's a migrant, their country of birth, when they came to the UK and how old they were and what passports they hold. And for households, we get um, living arrangements, which is like household composition. There are two variants on that. Um, so living arrangements and household competition, short-term residence, and account of the number of um, dimensions of deprivation. So within the census, they enumerate deprivation in terms of employment, health, housing, and education. Um, if we, if you're interested later on, we can talk about how those de those definitions are done. But when you look at the data, all of that should be within the um, documentation behind it. In terms of ethnic group at individual level, we get ethnic group, religion, national identity and language. And for households, we get households where ethnicity is mixed, um, an assessment of language competence in terms of English competence for members of the household and whether a household is multilingual. For veterans, at individual level, we get whether somebody previously served in the UK Armed Forces, um, we can tell from the census whether people are currently serving um, 
from another indicator and whether they're living in households or communal establishments. And at the household level, the number of veterans in a household and the household, whether the household reference person is a veteran. Um, in terms of housing for the individual, um, if for so people who are living in communal establishments, you'll get type of communal establishment and position. Position means either whether they're a resident or a member of staff. Um, you also get information about second addresses and the type of second address. Um, we'll come to the use of that later on in the later releases. Um, for a household, we get whether they share facilities, that means a kitchen or bathroom, the type of tenure, the type of accommodation or type of property, um, an occupancy rating measure on both bedrooms and um, rooms. So I'm happy to talk about that later on. It's uh, The definition has changed slightly um, and there, there may be issues if you're using this for comparability. Uh, whether people have cars and central heating and just thinking about household housing deprivation, this is based on there not being enough bedrooms or sharing facilities or lacking central heating. And then in terms of dwelling spaces, so these are um, all of the dwelling spaces. So census enumerators go out and estimate places that are unoccupied. So they say it, there's a flag saying whether a place is occupied and then the number of bedrooms and number of rooms. Um, labor market and travel to work. Um, so for an individual, we get the occupation, um, occupational social class, the nationals, socioeconomic classification, the industry, and the abandoned number of hours work. So we can tell the difference between those people who work part-time and full-time. Um, we also get whether somebody has ever worked, their current economic activity status. So that would include people like students, like um, people who are retired, people who are caring. And then the method of travel to work and distance travel to work. I think there's a note there about the point at which the census was taken. This was during lockdown. So um, this will be quite different to previous versions of the data. Um, a new question that came in in 2021 was around, new questions came in around sexual orientation and gender identity. Um, both of these were, we were uncertain about the return rates. I think the return rates have been quite good. But from an ONS perspective, they're quite nervous about the geographical scale they allow this data to be seen at. So um, if you're interested in that, you may have to deal with a higher level geography than ideally you would like. In terms of education, we get the highest level of qualification and whether uh, individuals are school children and full-time students. And in terms of education deprivation, um, this is seen as a household where nobody has a level two qualification or above, and level two is the equivalent of GCSE. Um, in terms of general health um, and disability, we get a self-assessed questionnaire on people's health, um, whether they're disabled, and whether they provide on paid care. Um, again, the health deprivation is picked up from the measures in general health and disability. Um, and then for a household level, we get the number of people with long term health problems or disability. So that was phase one. That was all of the data that we have available now. Um, what's what we're in the middle of is the release of phase two. So the, the first is about the short term population. So that's people who come to the UK and intend to stay for less than 12 months. So they've been enumerated, but they are short term residents. Um, the second one, which is what I suppose lots of researchers are looking for, is multivariate data that will have two or more variables at different scales. Um, now, the ONS have introduced a new um, interface um, that I've not seen yet. I've seen the pilot of it previously uh, called a flexible table builder. And what this will provide is the ability to put in uh, multiple variables. Uh, within it, it incorporates statistical disclosure control, which means that if the counts are too low, um, they will first of all maybe swap with neighbouring geographic areas, um, but also some counts will be suppressed because they're too low. 
Um, so it's quite likely that the categories available may be reduced. So for example, if you're looking at ethnicity and housing tenure, um, you might find that when you get to look at ethnicity or housing tenure, you can look at them at output area level in the smallest geographies, you may be pushed off a geographical scale or two uh, when you combine data because you'll have too many empty cells. And phase three has a number of different things. So there's, um, I'm going to go through each of these and um, say something more about them. So the alternative population base um, provide, will provide an estimate of workplace populations, uh, workday populations, which combines those people who are resident and not working and those who are working in the area. For students, you'll get out of term addresses um, and also second addresses for a number of potentially different reasons. So if it's a holiday home, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and those population bases should be based on people spending at least 30 days there. So for example, the MP who lives in their constituency and travels down to Westminster for Parliament would appear with two addresses, one somewhere in London and one where the constituency was. Um, and then for some of the questions, uh, we've been promised small populations. So for these, as well as the categories, um, so in ethnic group, there are 20 categories, um, there was a write-in option. So lots of um, much smaller uh, groups can be identified, similarly with country of birth, religion and national identity. Um, so for those where there's enough data, there's a commitment to produce data sets. So there's some examples here of what they've said in their initial documentation at the bottom, also about uh, British Sign Language, Romani, Somali, et cetera. Now, the next two sets of data are likely to only be available from um, the UK data service. They'll be available, I've been told, from the summer. So the first is flow data. So this is a particular type of data that shows where somebody came from um, based on where they were 12 months before um, in terms of migration um, and where they are. So we get can have some idea of migrant flow both internally and internationally. Um, secondly, we will get workplace flow. So this will be based on people's place of work and place of residence and what they say about their commuting. Um, similarly with second address and student flow. So this relates to the um, second address detail for the, um, and the out of term detail. Now for the flow data, we will hold an open version which won't hold much data a safeguarded version, which if you're registered with the UK data service, you'll be able to access, and also a secure version with more details. To access the secure version, you will need um, training and for your project to be approved, and you'll need to uh, use the data in a kind of safe space where you can't take it outside. Um, in effect, what you do is, is gate kept so that um, confidential data can't be released. Um, and the microdata is a set of um, multivariables about individuals. So the, there are a number of samples being released. Um, there's a 5% sample based on a regional geography and a 5% sample based on a combined local authority. Um, these are safeguarded. As I said, if you're registered, you'll be able to use them. There's a 1% household sample. And there's also one that's sent to an international census database at the University of Minnesota. So that's the safeguarded data. If you want more detail, then the secure data has 10% individual and 10% household samples. Um, those will be available, as I said, with training and approval of your project. So just to, to start off with, having done that, um, can we have a look at what information you're interested in? Um, so if you go into Mentimeter and just type in um, what you're interested in, we should start to see a word cloud developing.
So deprivation seems to be figuring quite big in the um, areas, housing, health, ethnicity, age, education, demographic details. So a number of kind of interesting areas. And then I, I suspect we could probably cluster some of these underneath that. Um, picking out one that just struck me, in terms of smoking, there's no data in the census about smoking. Um, and again, there's not much on it. There's nothing on income. So the proxy for income is either the occupation, which will give an occupation level or um, social class, but there's no direct measure of income. Um, one thing to say for those of you who are interested in researching areas that aren't connected here is that ONS are open to proposals um, through a secure service to try and link data from other places. So if, for example, you were looking at the health survey of, of England for the work on COVID, um, there were links made to census level data pre-release in order to um, enable people to look at it. Um, somebody's put in constituency level data, that will be there. Um, we'll be looking at ward data ourselves. Things around crime and violence are not really here. So again, you would need to link other data to them. Okay, so that's looking like an interesting, um, interesting word cloud. So let's move on to geographic scale. Um, so I'm going to use some examples here um, to, to illustrate this, but broadly speaking, the boundary data and the um, data that can be mapped into it will be available on a kind of administrative base for local authorities and health. So you could combine those to, to fit police force areas or local enterprise partnerships or sub-regional groupings of authorities such as Greater Manchester. There'll also be electoral data. So the ward data is available. I believe the constituency data is available or is about to be. Um, and lastly, the statistical areas, which I'm going to say a bit more about. Um, you can get these from the UK Data Service or the Open Geography Portal on ONS. So that's the kind of boundary data. So if you're interested in mapping, you need to, to look at those. Uh, the current status of the UK data service is you need to download the boundaries for the country, but there will be a boundary selector tool coming up fairly soon where you'll be able to pick the boundaries for the area you're interested in. So output areas were introduced in 2001, um, and the aim was, was twofold. One was to... Um, kind of make them more homogenous. So there was a matching of characteristics within the areas um, that meant that they would be similar in terms of things like tenure, property type, et cetera. Um, they were also set kind of minimum and maximum, maximum sizes. So the output area is the smallest, the building block, and that's where um, we can expect a more ho homogenous type of population. Prior to 2001, we simply use the collection base for the um, census, which was the enumeration district. Um, the second is that these are more stable over time. So from 2001 to 2011 and 2011 to 2021, the target was that there will be less than 5% of changes in output areas. And that's been achieved in terms of that change. Those output areas are then grouped up into lower layer super outputs areas. Um, this is maybe familiar to some of you, but it is used in a range of public um, published statistics. So the IMD indicators, index of multiple deprivation indicators, are all held at that level. Um, LSOA reported crime is held at that level. And then the largest grouping, which is probably equivalent to ward sizes, is the mid-layer super output area. Uh, and this has been used in statistics such as the COVID cases um, and educational attainment. So I'm just going to illustrate what happens here. So this is a map of um, tenure or the percentage of people in the private rented sector in the city of Manchester. And at the left, you can see um, the MSOA 
uh, you can see the distribution of the percentage in the right private rented sector. Um, and you can see some highlights where there seem to be large proportions. As we move along to the smaller area, the lower super output area, we see more distinction emerging. Um, and that's kind of um, interesting. And again, we get a bigger spread. And as we move into the output area, we can see the range goes now from naught up to 97%. We can see much more fine granular detail. Um, and this is the first point I suppose I wanted to make about representation, that we can see very detailed um, information, but how do we make that make sense to who our audience is? And as an example, I have taken that um, output area level from Manchester and mapped it onto the wards. So you can see the difference within wards as well as um, as the kind of shape of what's going on. And I focused in kind of around the university area where you can see these big pockets of private rented sector that may or may not have something to do with the university. But that's kind of broadly around the south of the city centre. Um, and you can see quite distinct patterns of tenure. If you were to look at the other tenure types, you would probably find things like social housing in parts of them, like ownership in parts of them. So that's the um, geographic scale. Um, I don't know why this says players, but um, I think it's because you can have a leaderboard. Okay, so a lot of people want to look at kind of smaller um, geographies, um, output areas, and then wards and then local authorities. Um, and the second one, and uh, what type of area do you want to profile? Um, and a kind of dominance of local authority, but with some sub-region, region, and country answers. Um, if we have time, uh, it would be interesting to know what the others are, but I'm, I don't think I've got time to stop and ask now. Uh, but if you want to put it in the chat, um, there's a couple about parishes, and it's not a question I know the answer to. It's one I'd have to go away and find out about. Um, I mean, they are clearly an electoral division. I'm not sure they're big enough for ONS to publish at that level, but we could um, ask that question. I can research that question afterwards. Okay, so um, moving on then. Um, this is where we're going to get into a bit of a practical um exercise. Uh, so there are three ways of accessing the aggregate data. There's ONS, um, the UK Data Service, and NOMIS. Um, and I'm just going to say a little bit more about them. And for completeness, there's also where you can get the boundary data. Um, so in the practical exercise, on the event page, I've shared a Word document, which is about accessing data. Um, and what I'd like you to do is just have a look at these different areas. So ONS gives you um, data. You can scale your geography, the type of area you want to select and the, bound, the boundary of it. So if you're doing, for example, a local authority, you could set the local, select the um, wards within, the lo within a particular lo local authority. ONS also has a number of supporting materials and the release calendar if you want to keep up with what's coming from the census. Um, the UK data service, our data site is currently in development. So at the moment you have to uh, download all of the data and take out what you want. Um, there are boundary data as well. Um, there's supporting material, including some explainers about some of the variables. Um, so a section on race and migration, um, things about the new variables, veterans, sexual identity and gender identity. Um, and within NOMIS, you can pick the data similar to ONS. You can say the, ge the geography you want um, and bound that within a particular area. And you can also select the categories you want to, to pick up. Um, so if you want to access that document, 
Um, can we just check people can access that first of all? Um, I will pick up the chat later on and have a look at some of those questions. Um, one thing to say about is that the Scottish release isn't until next year. So um, we haven't really got to grips with what's going to happen there. Okay. Um, yeah. So Chris has put a link in the chat to the the document. Uh, well, to the to the web page. The document is called Accessing Data. So it's the first on the screen. Okay. So I mean, I think this is an opportunity if you want to have a conference break as well to take. Uh, 10, 15 minutes and we'll come back. Um, hopefully you'll get a flavor of what the different websites offer. Um, I think it's fair to say for all of them, they will be changing over time. They're likely to converge to somewhere similar um, with the ability to select multivariables, to scale your geography, et cetera. But at the moment, that's the current state of them. So I'm just gonna take a conference break myself. I'll be back in five minutes. Um, so if you have any questions during that time, then pop them into the Q&A. A quick question I can answer. LSOAs, OAs and MSOAs are all bounded within local authority, um, but they don't overlap or they, they don't fit ward boundaries. So the method ONS use for output areas mapping to ward boundaries is a statistical one. So there may be different counts. If you um, are involved with the London in with London, the census information in London, for example, they use their own method based on housing. Um, and household data is used as a sampling base, and, and a lot of surveys will be rebased for that. So, the first question I've got up is about the short term visitor population. Um, it will include people who are staying in an establishment or a um, household. So, it would ask them to complete an individual form, which would say whether they were short-term visitors. So for example, I had somebody coming to visit me from overseas, they would have been completed on, they would have been in my census return. So it, it has no information about visas or citizenship, but it would include them if they completed the form. Um, the health deprivation in that metric is based on people who say their health is poor or very poor. Jonathan's asked about the small population data. Some of that is available, so you can get the um, ethnicity and religion data um, at the moment at local authority level. Um, the thing to do is to watch the ONS release calendar um, because their dates have tended to shift around. So the, the kind of Dates that are becoming firmer around the flexible table builder um, and that multivariate data. But what, what you'll see is others with kind of more gen general times for release. Somebody's asked what are the percentage samples? Um, I'm not sure about those. Um, I'm not sure what you mean by the question. Um, if you could um, expand on that. Um, Charlie, you can go to the UK Data Service without logging in. Um, it, if you're going to use it in future, particularly for safeguarded data, it's a good idea to register. Okay, for, there's a question about the number of deprivations in the ONS data and IMD. The answer is there isn't much connection. Um, so the index of multiple deprivation has 32 indicators um, that are uh, amalgamated together into seven domains, whereas the um, census data is fairly basic. So uh, we've talked about health, we've talked about um, education, and we've talked about housing. The other uh, characteristic is employment, and that's if there's a household with nobody working. So the only question outstanding is on the percentage samples, which I'm not sure um, what you meant by if you could. Yeah, I think you're right that short-term resident population is not necessarily reliable. It won't include everybody who's here. Um, housing affordability data, I'm I'm not sure it's available at that level. The last it's a while since I've looked at it. Um, so um, the last time I looked at it, it was at MSOA level. 
Um, okay, how, why are ONS UK Day Service and um, Nomis different? Um, well, ONS, this is the first time they've released the data. So in the past, they've released it through Nomis and through us. Um, and we've used a different tool to the one we're using now. Nomis looks like it's using something fairly similar. Um, so the ONS is a kind of newcomer in terms of the way to access data. And I think partly it's because we have different aud audiences. So Nomis is probably more familiar to those involved in um, policy areas in uh, public services. Um, and the UK data service tends to have a more academic base, though a number of policy people do use it as well, particularly for other information. Um, I wouldn't want to comment um, on the APIs. I know my colleagues who've been taking in the aggregate data have said they have had quite a lot of work to do. Um, so I don't know what ONS's plans are for that in terms of public release. They've obviously released something to Nomis and to us. Um, and I'm not sure that's a public document as yet. But at some stage, I would expect them to be transparent and to release the API documentation. Well, I'll just give a couple more minutes to um, for you to have a look at those. And then we'll return back to the um, to the information we're to the rest of the question. A couple of things in the Q&A um, from Keith, the best source for ge geography undergrads to use in a practical class. Um, at the moment, I would probably say ONS because they're the first to the past, so they will have the multivariate da data. Um, it depends on what else you're doing with them because uh, the UK Data Service has probably more explanatory stuff aimed at, um, at that audience and also holds a no number of other resources that might be interesting um, to you. So I think that's... Uh, um, hi, Jasmine. I'll try and find the paper um, and put a link in the chat for output area classifications, but... Um, uh, sorry, on the event page. Um, there was some work done for the 2001 census um, by a colleague at UCL, which was an, a Leeds, um, which was how they arrived at those. Um, they, I think they took a, a load of um, potential variables and saw how significant they were. Um, um, hi, Vita. I'm not sure of the geography in Scotland, um, but there will be smaller areas than local authorities. Okay, I think um, we'll go back to the webinar then. So thanks for those questions. Um, hopefully I've answered some of them, which I didn't expect to be able to do. Um, so that was the, the practical exercise, uh, the first one. The second, um, there's a lot of data on the event page, and I'll be suggesting you have a look at that and then we come back. So thinking about building an area profile, what do you need to decide? Um, so first of all, you, you decide your variables, as we've said, what things you're going to include in that area profile, whether it's an economic profile, um, a demographic profile, etc. cetera. Um, you then need to get that data and prepare it, um, define your geographical scale, um, and then decide how you're going to represent it. So it could be by using mapping, it could be by using statistical summaries of the data or tables or charts. Um, and a couple of types of indicators that might be useful for this are, um, are here. So this is taken from the MSOAs in the six Olympic boroughs in London. And what I've done is to look at the proportion of a particular group in an area, such as a neighborhood. So it's an MSOA level, and I've combined counts of families with dependent children. So that's couples, lone parents, and other families with dependent children, and divided them by all the households in an area. So what you can see is, is this an area where there's a lot of dependent children? And you can see a graph here of the distribution of that those percentages. Similarly, you could map these and, and band them um, as I did with tenure. Um, 
And what this tells you is there are you know, some areas where there are high proportions of dependent children and some areas where there are low proportions. Um, when I did this kind of exercise in um, Greater Manchester at local uh, LSOA level, what it showed was parts of the city where there were very few children. Uh, those linked very much to the city centre and to the kind of what we call the Oxford Road corridor, which is where MMU and uh, Manchester University are located. Now, the second thing you might want to do is to focus on a particular group. Um, so in your, in your community, you may have a particular group um, that you're interested in looking at. So how are they distributed? And what this measure does is to take the count of households with dependent children in an area and divide it by the count of all dependent children in all areas, um, multiply it by the number of areas. So the number you get if there was an even distribution should be around one. And you can see the majority fit into that. But there are some areas where there's quite high concentrations and some areas where there's quite low concentrations. So these um, kind of fit into uh, the measures. And in a couple of the example spreadsheets here, I've added in those measures. Um, okay, so we've got some answers about Scotland in the chat. So moving on from there, um, what I've provided is a number of different spreadsheets on the event page. Um, I'll just pick up one as an example. Um, so we've got um, the bedroom standard, country of birth, ethnicity, household composition, um, highest level of qualification, industry, uh, occupational social class, occupancy levels, um, sorry, occupation, uh, religion, tenure. Can you see this on the screen? Yes, we can, Nigel. So if I go into the religion one, um, I've picked out the wards in Derby, Leicester and Nottingham. Um, and this is the table that came down from uh, Nomis. Um, what I've done is add in a second table where I've translated that into a um, the local authority ward the counts, and then I've gen generated that second indicator, the concentration indicator. So if you look at Derby, you can see there's one ward, Blay Greaves, with where 19% of the Sikh population live, another where 21% live, um, 15 and 16%. So they are quite concentrated in particular parts of Derby. So that kind of measure could be applied to any of those religious groups. Similarly, I've used the other indicator with tenure. Um, so here, this is the, the raw data coming from no misses here. And then I've looked at the proportion in the private rented sector, again, by ward level. So we can see, again, some um, quite big differences between the concentrations with 41% um, in less than one area, 62%, 48%, etc. So I'm just gonna go back to this and um, to say, have a look at those now and um, see what you can do with those. Now, I haven't tried to produce a profile um, document myself because I think it depends on what variables you want to use. Um, but this would give you a kind of ward level report based on a number of the indicators. So for those of you who aren't going to work away and get your own data because you're not at that stage yet, if you want to practice, these data sets are there available for you to, to use and play with. Uh, you could, for example, do a profile of Nottingham or a profile of Leicester or Derby. So if you want to have a quick look at those, think about um, how you might use them um, the kind of indicators you might want to generate. Um, and we'll give you about 10 minutes um, and then come back for a kind of final set of slides. So we'll come back at 10 past and kind of um, finish off the webinar, have a chance to um, answer, go through any more questions. So if you have more questions, then um, pop them into the Q&A.
um, and we'll try and wrap up. There's a small um, survey as well about um, our approach to events in the future. Um, if you are going to go um, before that, because you've got other commitments, could you please fill in the feedback as well? Thank you. Right, so I'll give another minute or so um, to have a look at those, but um, they will be available on the page for those of you who want to look at them. Um, and then just want to say a few more things about area profiles. Um, I suppose the main one um, will be about data that's to come. OK, I've got a couple of questions coming through. So um, geometric centroids are available through the UK Data Service. Um, so you'll have to look at the kind of set of supporting geographical information. Um, I can't directly point you to it now, but if you have an issue with it, then email me or call the help desk and we can sort out access. Um, they should also be on the Open Geography Portal, but I'm not, I, I haven't used that. I tend to have used the UK data service. Um, Charlie has asked about MSOA level data. So this is the um, ONS's own area profiling tool. Uh, you can download that data. So it's about going through um, identifying the data you want um, in ONS and then picking the MSOAs within the geography you're interested in. OK, so um, let's just go back now to the, the presentation. Um, so, so I suppose the, the, the big thing personally I've been interested in is when we can look at um, different characteristics of uh, the place or the people we're interested in. So, um, for example, I had a student who did some work on um, the Bangladeshi population and how they changed over time. And looking at that, we we used the um, different aspects of the housing conditions, um, the educational uh, attainments, employment, etc. And that was possible, therefore, to produce a um, a picture in Greater Manchester of how the Bangladeshi population had changed over time. So we used census data from 1991, which was when the first ethnic categories were put into the census, through to 2011. Um, similarly, if you wanted to look at um, ageing, you might look at the neighbourhoods where older people lived, and that would give you some kind of focus um, on how to model the experiences they had in terms of similarly of employment, health, education, housing, etc. Um, when so so the multivariate data is going to be very important for meaningful area profiles, and I think um, we will be developing courses, but having not seen the flexible table builder or the way that either NOMIS or the UK data service will translate that. Um, uh, there will be um, work for us to do before we can advertise courses. But on that basis, I'm just going to see. Um, so you've got the presentation slide so you can look at um, our training events. Uh, we have a set of what we would call core courses, so an introduction to the data service um, using the secure access service, which is the training to acquire accreditation, how to find data, data management. And for those of you involved in teaching, we also support students through the dissertation program uh, for those who are using our data. Um, a range of other courses available on things like longitudinal research, one coming up on mental health research using um, the practical element we use data, crime mapping using R, some stuff on computational social science and time series analysis. Um, so what we plan in terms of sensor course, census courses is probably to repeat some of these because they do seem to be very popular, but also once we get at the multivariate data to develop these courses on um, and make them more accessible, similarly when flow data and microdata become available. Um, we've arranged with ONS to do a workshop on statistical disclosure control, which will be linked to multivariate data. 
and in the future are also likely to do one on the kind of quality assurance. So one of the key things to say about the census, and we don't can't see the data yet below local authority level, is that they are the numbers that we get are estimates. Um, so we never, in most areas, we don't get 100% of responses. And those responses will vary between type of um, neighborhood. So there are some um, quality assurance things to think about uh, once we get that smaller level data to see um, which populations might be under or overrepresented. And there's my email address. So um, if I've said so, or if I haven't said so, if there are things you want to um, ask me about, then please do. Um, I'll go through the chat, which had quite a lot about geography and definitely research the parish, parish issue. I think somebody's already the, answered the question about Scotland. Um, I think it's fair to say that a lot of these courses will be repeated with Scottish data once that data has been released. Um, and following on from that, there will also be um, kind of some. OK, so thanks very much. I think we're going to close the webinar now um, and look at our events page to see what's coming up. The um, there are likely to be more census courses developed as we um, as the releases are made available. Um, as I said, there's definitely going to be one on statistical disclosure control. We will be doing multivariate data as well um, and potentially something on the quality assurance processes that ONS used. Um, so enjoy yourself and thanks very much.